Buckle up, everyone. You are strapped in and ready for the Insurance Hour with me, your host, Carl Sussman, informing, educating, and entertaining Californians one policy at a time. This is Insurance Hour. Hello, hello, everyone. How are you? This is Carl Sussman, your host of Insurance Hour. Thanks so much for joining in. I am here today to answer and demystify all of your insurance-related questions. You can reach me right now at 559-656-0317 or send your questions to questions at insurancehour.com. If you have something really urgent, it can't wait, you need help right now, right now, right now, you can just dial pound 250 from your cell phone, use keyword insurance, and that will connect you to someone that can hopefully help you right away. Maybe not 24 hours a day, but as close as we possibly can. And on that note, let me dive right in. You know, it's funny, I was listening to the introduction just now and I was thinking, educating and entertaining about insurance. Well, I can definitely say that we're educating you here. As far as am I entertaining, I don't really know. I need your feedback on that. So feel free to shoot me a note on that or leave a comment or however you might be listening to this. Remember, you can catch the entire program on on radio, on terrestrial radio, on YouTube, on any podcast you can imagine, iHeartRadio, tune in all over the place. So find us and uh, give me that feedback because actually sitting here listening, I was wondering, Am I entertaining? I don't even know. (laughs) Without any further ado, let's jump in and go through some information. Uh, I did receive a handful of emails, but I'm going to put them on hold maybe till a little bit later because I want to talk about the recent fires that we were having in Texas. Now, I know that um, at this stage, it seems redundant to say this is unusual because anything weather related seems unusual to us, right? We're seeing weather patterns and events that are literally we have not seen before. And it's not hyperbole to say never before because it has literally not been the case. I can tell you in Southern California, just yesterday, sunny skies, blue skies, not a cloud in the sky. All of a sudden the phone made that God awful sound that you know it makes when you get an alert and it says flood watch. And I looked around, I thought, flood watch? And no sooner does that happen, I get a phone call from someone in another part of Los Angeles to say, is it crazy raining over there? And I said, no. I would say, 15 minutes later, downpour, thunder, lightning, pouring rain, unbelievable. So that's not normal. Or I should say that is normal now. It did not used to be that way. I'm born and raised in Southern California, so I can tell you that that's not the way weather normally happens. The weatherman's usually pretty pretty consistent with their predictions, and we normally will know about weather patterns coming long before they arrive. This was not on the weather forecast. This was not discussed even the day before, right? You know, you always look at your app on the phone. You say, what's the weather tomorrow? Oh, okay. And depending on where you live, it's usually not much of a surprise when that is what happens. We had clear skies on the forecast. There was nothing like that coming. It just goes to speak about how dramatically different weather events are now than they used to be. And this is really the new normal we have to deal with. Now, Texas does have wildfires. It does happen. It's not known for them. It's not something that when you think of wildfire, you, of course, think of California, lucky California. But this actually is a large wildfire that occurred in Texas. It took down over 500 homes. Now, they're saying this is an event that typically will happen there every 10 to 15 years. So uh, it's horrible to say we hope. We hope that we're not going to see another one anytime soon, but I'm suspect, right? Because everything is so unpredictable at this point. Everything that we used to believe to be the case is not always the case, right? Events that we would see predicting weather even is just not as conclusive as it used to be. Now, the reason I wanna talk about these, these homes that were destroyed is, according to reports that I'm reading, a lot of these folk that lost their homes were uninsured. Now, of course, that's where, you know, I hear uninsured, my ears pop up and all my feeds of news, you know, start sending me information about that. And that's why I'm talking about it now. And I did a little bit of digging to see why were these people not insured? Was it because there was not the availability? Was it price? Was it choice? What was it? So here's what I found. And again, if you're in Texas in the Panhandle area and and you were affected by this or you know someone who was, please feel free to reach out and let me know your personal experience, I'm going to give you some general feedback about what I read on the research I was doing. 
A lot of the people that were uninsured were uninsured because the premiums that were being charged for their insurance in those areas they felt were too high to afford. Now, does this fall under the category of insurance has become too expensive, we need to find a way to make it lower? Or does it fall under the bad choice consumer, it might have been too exp- might, might have been expensive, but you should have still opted to have it? It really just depends on how you look at it and who you like to place the blame on. But what I think it speaks to is a larger picture, which is that when we see insurance prices going up, there's a reason, right? It's not random. And it's not happening in one place like just California or just in Texas or just in Florida or just the areas that you might hear about. It's happening everywhere. I did a little bit of additional research and I'll share with you some of the numbers just to give you an idea of what property insurance is costing right now across the country. I'm looking at it so excuse my eyeballs off the camera. but. You can have a range of average homeowners premiums. Anywhere in Alabama, for example, is showing about $2,085 a year for a homeowner's policy. You can go to Alaska, which is half that cost at $1,000, $1,019 a year on average. California falls at about $1,266 on average for homeowner's insurance. Colorado, now you don't hear a lot about Colorado, right? It's cool, skiing, all is good, no problems. Colorado, their average property insurance premium is $3,212. Wow, that's high. Why is that? It's based on losses, it's based on costs. You can look at some other states. I'll jump in just a few more, just because, of course, I'm the insurance nerd, and to me, it's fi- I find it fascinating. Would you believe that in Kansas, you know, we're not in Kansas anymore. Well, if you're in Kansas still, you could be looking at an average homeowner's premium of $4,072 a year. It's a lot of money, folks. That's four times the price of Alaska. Okay, maybe not a, f- a fair example. But how about Oklahoma? $4,565 average homeowner's annual premium. So we're looking at very, very large gaps between what one person pays in one area and one person pays in another. I'll give you one more just to blow your mind. Vermont. Good old Vermont. $694 for the average homeowner's policy. $600. Now, keep in mind also that when you're looking and when you're hearing these numbers, you should know that these are based on an average home with an insurance value of $250,000 replacement cost. Now, in certain areas, that might be sufficient for a home. In other areas, you might hear that and say, $250,000, you can't rebuild a garage for that. Places like California, for example, it's a lot more expensive to rebuild. So you have to understand that there are there's a large discrepancy between what people are paying in one area or another statewide. Now, when you look at large states like Texas or California or Florida, you could see variations like that within the state itself, drastic changes. And what's important is that we understand that these are based on numbers. This isn't someone flipping a coin in general and saying, I think we'll charge them this. I think we'll charge them that. This is based on loss experience. It's based on predicting loss and it's based most significantly on what the actual costs are to rebuild these properties after a loss. And we're gonna talk a little bit more about what those types of costs look like and why they've gone up so high and what they actually are, because that is what is driving a lot of this. And depending on what state you live in, you might have a department of insurance that tends to be considered more flexible or less flexible when it comes to what it permits insurance carriers to underwrite based on. Some insurance carriers in certain states are given very specific guidelines. You can only look at X, Y, and Z to determine your rate, and that's it. Whereas other states will say, look at whatever you want, and they let competition do its thing. And some companies are very inexpensive, and some companies are very expensive. Consumers can pick and choose. So it's important that right now, as we're seeing costs go up everywhere, mind you, maybe I buried the lead on that one. Every one of these states, Every state in the country is seeing increases in the premiums they're paying for property insurance and auto insurance. And not by a little bit, by a lot. You might see headlines that say things like, auto insurance premiums are increasing faster than inflation. Okay, well inflation is just one aspect of what creates the premium that you're paying for auto insurance. So that sort of makes sense, right? 
inflation is one marker that's used. It's one marker to show us what the costs of goods and services are. And, and there's actually some tweaking that the government does depending on what actual inflation number you're looking at. Some things they actually remove because they fluctuate so drastically. Some things they include. You know how it is. You can number, Numbers can be made to look a lot of different ways depending on how you, do, how you decide to, uh, to look at them or what you decide to include. But understand that every state and every city, you're going to be seeing significant increases in the costs of insurance for property and auto. Of course, your mileage may vary. You might be in one particular area where things have gone down. You might have changed your risk profile. You might have done some things to make your risk seem less um you might made it, may have done things to make yourself less of a risk for a loss. And what does that mean? It means if you're doing those things, then hopefully the insurance carriers are allowed to give you discounts for doing things to make you less of a risk. So I, when we come back from this quick break, I want to talk a little bit about some of the factors that are impacting the rates that you're seeing and other things you can do about them to try and lower that rate right after this. California's insurance market can be challenging, but Sussman Insurance Agency knows the way. Trusted for two generations in home, auto, and personal insurance. Call 877-411-5200 or visit sussmaninsurance.com. Navigate with confidence. Hello, hello, and welcome back. Thanks for listening once again to Insurance Hour with me, your host, Carl Sussman. I am here to answer your insurance-related questions. Please feel free to call at 559-656-0317 or send your questions to questions at insurancehour.com. It's an easy email address. Come on, I worked really hard to get it. Use it. Send those questions in. Remember, if you have a question, the likelihood is somebody else might have that same question. And speaking of questions, I had one that came in that during the break, and I want to just jump right into it, and then we'll get back to what we were talking about. The question is asking, and I'll read it, can retired people purchase life insurance? It's a fair question. So let me address that in its most general term. First of all, when you're talking about someone who is in retirement age or they have retired, first of all, these days, that could be a wide range of ages, right? In general, just because you retire, it doesn't mean that you can or can't get life insurance. It doesn't really change that factor too dramatically. Now, the reason you might be wondering, well, why is this person asking about life insurance after retirement? A lot of people have life insurance through their employer. So they're thinking, well, if I'm retiring and I still wanna have life insurance, what do I do? So let me address that first. It's important if you do have life insurance through your employer that you find out if the policy is convertible or portable. Those are the two catchphrases to ask. What that means is, in the event one of two things happens, one, your employer decides to no longer offer life insurance, or two, you leave your employer, like retire, can you take that policy with you or not? Remember, those policies are group policies, so you're not underwritten individually. They're not asking you a ton of health questions. You're just getting sometimes a multiplier of the amount of coverage of the income that you're generating. They'll give you a face amount based on that. Sometimes they're just blocks that you can pick from, but they're not going through an underwriting process. So you, whether you are a healthy person or a not so healthy person, if you're on a group life policy and you have that policy, it's very important to know, can you take it with you if you leave work? So let's go under the assumption for this discussion that the person is retiring and they do not have the ability to take their life insurance policy with them. What do they do? Well, they go to the open market and they can look to purchase a policy directly and own it themselves. Now, there are a handful of different types of insurance products that are out there that can be useful for someone in this situation. They can be purchased directly from an insurance company. They can be purchased from an insurance agent or broker. In this situation, it's probably advisable to go to an insurance agent or broker since they're going to be able to try and help advise you, certainly more than I'm going to do in these few seconds we're talking about it on the radio. But keep in mind that just because you retire, it does not preclude you from purchasing life insurance. You you can still purchase a term life insurance policy depending on your age and health conditions. You can purchase a whole life policy, again, depending on your age and health conditions. Universal life, index universal life, there's all sorts of possible policies you can get. You can even look to get an accidental death policy, which will only pay in the event something happens to you, boom, you're gone. Not health related. That sounds horrible. Boom, you're gone. Should be a better way to say that. You get the point. There are options to be able to purchase life insurance even if you are retired. There's your takeaway. And again, my recommendation would probably be 
do some research. And a great place to start that research is to talk to a licensed agent or broker because that's what they do for a living, right? They're going to be able to give you a lot of information that you can utilize to try and decide what type of policy to get, what type of policy works for you, what it costs, how long will it last, and, and what you can qualify for as well. So thank you for that question. That's the fastest question that came in and answer that came out. I have others ahead of it, I apologize, but this one just happened to come in during the break while I was having a sip of my water and I thought, you know what, that's a good question. I'm just gonna jump on it. Before the break, I was talking about uh, things that impact the insurance premium that you're paying. And we mentioned inflation as being one of those. And we hear about inflation and we stop and we think, what does that mean exactly? We know that it means that interest rates change, right? Everyone knows, well, inflation affects interest rates. But what does inflation do to your bottom line and how does it impact insurance? Let me give you a brief list, a brief list of things that inflation has impacted the cost of. Let's go through a few of them. We're talking about food, grocery, things like meat, dairy, produce, significant increases in what it costs to purchase those items, okay? Energy, gasoline, electrical, natural gas. For households and businesses, the cost for that has gone up significantly. Housing, rent, prices of homes. Even though they keep climbing and climbing and climbing, inflation is pushing those prices even higher. You have a situation where people have old, I say old, it's funny enough, right? A few years ago, they locked in interest rates that were super low and they're less likely to want to sell their home because they can't get interest rates that low on a new loan. So they're holding onto those homes, which means less homes for sale, which means the homes are for sale, the prices go up. So inflation is impacting the cost of homes fairly dramatically as well. Cars, new and used, are both more expensive due to inflation it's because the values are higher because it's harder to get them. It's costing more money to make them. The underlying parts for these vehicles are costing more money. And when a new car costs more money, what does that do to the price of used cars? Whoop, raises it up as well. Household goods, everyday items like furniture, appliances, cleaning supplies, even those items have become more expensive and they have to do with issues surrounding how the companies are able to get these chemicals, how they're able to get the supplies, even down to how they're able to get that out to consumers. Medical care, I know you're not gonna be shocked by this, but the cost of healthcare, prescription drugs, and in, in premiums all around them are being impacted. Now, I know that Health insurance is a tough one because there is such a wide variety between what people pay, depending on whether they have an individual policy, a group policy, the range is drastic. But overall, for everybody, those prices have gone up. We're also talking about inflation affecting the costs of transportation, gas prices, public transportation, ride sharing. Have you noticed your Uber, Lyft, and whatever other ride share service you're using? Those costs have gone up. I remember looking last time I used one of them and it said, I looked at the price and I thought, are prices surging right now? Is there some, is there a concert going on? Why is the price so high? The cost has just gone up. Why? Well, look at those other reasons. That driver has to pay more for gas. The technology is costing more to maintain. All of those things are going on. Travel costs like airfare, hotel rooms, rental car prices, all of those things have also gone up for, again, the same reasons above. You see how it starts to pile on itself, right? You have to pay more for a hotel room because the hotel has to pay more for gas, for electrical, for labor, for all of those things that we were talking about. Everything's connected, right? Education, tuition costs, college fees, university costs, textbooks, you name it. All of those items are costing more money for the same reasons we keep talking about because we're seeing those items costing more to generate. And if it costs more to generate, you're going to pay more to get it. And finally, even personal items and personal services like getting a haircut, beauty treatment, you know, a facial, uh, all that stuff, a massage, all of those costs have also gone up dramatically. Again, why? Because of those costs of labor that go behind them. Now, why does this matter? And how does this relate to insurance? This is the part that I really want you to pay attention to, really pay attention. All of those things that I just listed and more are things that insurance companies need to pay when you have a loss. When you have a car accident, the insurance company has to pay to repair your car. Let's use that as an example. Well, those car parts are more expensive now, as we talked about dramatically. You have to have a rental car while your car is in the shop, assuming you have the right coverage. And we already know rental car coverage is higher. 
there are more complicated um, installations required for people that are having cars worked on. We talked about that as well. That means it's going to cost more money. So all of these things that we've talked about that go behind, that go on behind the scenes, the insurance carriers have to pay those higher prices. And if they're paying those higher prices, the premiums are going to be affected as well. It's, it's just a balancing act, right? If you have to pay more for a rental car, then you have to pay more for rental car coverage. That's just how it works. And we're seeing that on a scale industry-wide, worldwide. This is not California, Florida, Texas, Oklahoma. This is everywhere. This is around the globe. All of these costs are higher and all of the accompanying premiums are higher because of it. Now, I made an interesting point there without you even realizing it. So I want to draw your attention to something. Understand that as inflation is a worldwide phenomenon, we're actually, in the United States anyway, we're luckier than most because inflation numbers are actually lower here than they are in other parts of the world. So you might be in Singapore, I'm just pulling this out of nowhere, and you might be seeing larger percentages of inflation impacting all of those goods and services and products that I mentioned than you are in the United States. Now, I'm not trying to say, yay, USA, but it's a fact that the numbers, the inflationary dollars are lower in the United States than they are in other parts of the world. Is it lower somewhere in the world other than the United States? Probably. I'm not a financial expert, so I can't tell you that with any guarantees. But I can tell you in general terms, the United States tends to be one of the places that's impacted by inflation less than other parts, in the, than the other parts of the world. So that's car insurance. What about home insurance? Well, if you have a loss to your home, let's go through it. You need to be somewhere else temporarily. You need temporary housing. Didn't we talk about how costs to rent a house have gone up? Costs to stay in a hotel have gone up. They have to help compensate you for your food costs. Well, we know how expensive food is. We talked about that as well. All of those costs go into what the insurance carrier has to pay because you're, you're out of your home while there's repairs being done. What about entertainment? What about all of the expenses that you incur when you are on a claim? And I say on a claim, I'm making air quotes, meaning all of the things that an insurance company would be responsible for based on the policy you have and the coverage that is triggered in the event of a covered loss. All of those things cost more money. We know that, right? We all know. You ask anybody right now, hey, are things expensive today or they seem more expensive than they were a year, two years, three years, four years ago? and you'll get a resounding, yes, everything is a lot more expensive. And that's the aspect that is a bit of a puzzle because we have to stop and realize that, well, if we all accept and we all understand that everything is costing more money, then we have to also accept by extension that the one entity that has to buy all of those things that we've already agreed cost more is going to have to charge more. And I'm not trying to make excuses. I'm not trying to justify insurance premiums going higher. It's a very complicated concept, but I'm just talking about this pure factor of inflation and its impact on insurance premiums. You can't accept one without the other. You can't say that, yes, everything is more expensive, but it should not be reflected in the premiums that I pay when you realize that the insurance carriers are paying for those items that you've already said have gotten more expensive. Do you, you follow what I'm saying? You, you can't have it both ways. And I think that people really would do well to, to sort of have more of an understanding that sure, are there bad actors out there that are trying to take advantage and get higher premiums than are reasonable? Of course, that's the case in every business. However, overall, as an industry, the insurance industry, because it's so heavily regulated both on the state and on the federal to some extent level, certainly globally, there's different regulations that come into play. Your premium increases that impact, in, that are being impacted by inflation should not be discounted. And just keep that little piece, that little nugget in mind when your renewal premium comes, that part of the reason it's, the premium is higher, potentially a significant reason that it's higher, is because now you understand the connection. Well, everything is more expensive. The carrier buys the everythings. So naturally the premium to be able to have that coverage is going to cost more money as well. And hopefully that makes sense. If it doesn't, please reach out to me. I would love to discuss it more because it's a key aspect that I think as it goes under that educational 
piece that I want everyone to understand. Again, I'm not a financial specialist, but I want you to understand the correlation between inflation and insurance premiums. Okay, having said all of that, we understand that inflation can impact insurance premiums. We understand that insurance premiums can go up. So what is it that we can do to try and lower those premiums from the place that we now see, and I'm sure all agree, is costing more, right? We, we've, we've gotten past that. We accept the fact that, yes, things are costing a lot more money now than they used to. So the, the question then becomes, what can we do about that? What are some things that we're able to do to lower our insurance premiums? And again, depending on where you are, that could be a small, uh, could, that could be a small impact on your premium or a large one. Incidentally, I wanted to give you some more stats because I find this interesting. I did a search to find out what the top 10 states that have seen the highest rates, rate increases for property insurance are in the country. And I'm gonna read them to you. I think you'll find it interesting. These are the top 10 states that have had the highest premium increases on homeowners insurance in 2023. Number one, Florida. Number two, Louisiana. Number three, California. Number four, Texas, number five, Oklahoma, number six, Kansas, number seven, Colorado, number eight, Mississippi, number nine, Arkansas, and number 10, Missouri. Now, if you listen to the show earlier, depending on when you're jumping in, remember, if you missed part of this, you can jump on YouTube and find it under Insurance Hour. You can find it as a podcast. You can find it replaying on your favorite radio station. It's, it'll be out there. We talked in the first part of the show about states and their average premiums. And guess what? Some of those states just came up in this list again. What does that tell you? Some of the higher premium states are the states that have just recently had the highest increases. So by that same logic, we can say, well, they, they must have had the lower premiums before if their rates are higher now and they're on the list of the most highest increased states. So interesting, right? Interesting. So that tells me that the states that have taken the premium increases the most are the states that were, I say, least prepared or at least were underpriced for what rates should have been or could have been or certainly will be going forward. It's interesting to do a little bit of backwards research and realize because you're getting that insurance premium and you're annoyed and you're, and you're peeved and you're saying, well, why is this happening? And then you do a little bit of research and find out, oh, it's actually, it could have been a lot worse. It, it could have been a lot more expensive for a long time. And now at least we can see more transparency and understand why we're seeing the rates that we have. I wanna focus on one particular thing that people can do to try and lower their insurance premium. And there's a program called the Safer for Wildfire program. Now this is a program that was instituted to try and help people take a little bit more uh, control, let's say, over the insurance premiums that they're paying for their property insurance, giving them control to be able to lower that premium and more importantly, giving them the ability to have the likelihood of a loss be less. Keep that in mind. The insurance carrier and you are on the same page. You know what they both want? No losses. That's the ideal. Remember, loss is bad. Loss doesn't mean, yippee, now I can file a claim and get some money back for the premium I've been paying. That's kind of messed up. A loss is bad. It means something bad happened. Sure, it might be good to know that you have a policy in place that can help try and get you your stuff back, but it's nothing to be celebrated. It means something bad happened. So back to the Safer for Wildfire program. It's a voluntary designation awarded to homes that meet very specific criteria for wildfire resilience. Things like having a fire resistive roof, clear defensible space from brush, ember resistant vents, things of that nature. And you can go online and do a search for Safer for Wildfire program and you can see what characteristics also need to be there. Now, this program also, it recognizes communities that have taken collective action to reduce wildfire risks. 
like implementing community-wide wildfire mitigation plans and maintaining clear evacuation routes. So this is not just something that people can do individually. This is something that their entire community can get involved in. And I have to tell you, going forward, this is going to become more and more significant when it comes to values of homes. If you're purchasing a home that has this designation, you are going to see those values of the value of those homes higher than in a similar area that does not have it. So talk to folks in your neighborhood, talk to your city council, try and get some help if you need it. See what you can do to be involved and to try and see if you can get your community to be a wildfire prepared community, okay? Depending on the insurance company, some carriers right now are offering discounts for people that actually have this designation. It's a slow process. And for whatever reason, well, bureaucracy, let's, let's face it. Because of bureaucracy and what has to get done, because it's such a slow process to get the designation, it also is a slow process for the insurance carriers to be in a place to be able to offer discounts. As we've talked about on this show many, many times, most states have fairly stringent regulations with insurance carriers, so to give them the ability to offer a discount, literally even a discount, they have to get permission. Are they going to focus their attention and focus their time to try and create a discount when there might be a handful of communities in the entire state they're doing business? Probably not. So this is more of a chicken and the egg situation. People might not be as eager to do these things to get this designation because they're not seeing an immediate reduction of their insurance premium. And because they're not, the insurance carriers aren't rushing to put discounts in place to do it. What does it do in the meantime? Uh, protect your home from fire. It's kind of important. I, again, I want people to try and understand and get back to that, that, that basis that look, the goal is not to have a loss. The goal is not to let your house burn down. That's what you would like to see happen, right? Just because you don't get a discount for making your house less, your house less likely to burn doesn't mean it's not worthwhile to do, right? When that fire starts coming, you always want to do what you can to be as prepared and prevent that loss from happening. Now, we've got a caller. Her name is Amber. Let's bring her on and see what we can do for her. Amber, you are live with Carl Sussman on Insurance Hour. How can I help you? Hi, good morning. Um, I was just curious to know, um, a friend of mine was just on her honeymoon and uh, lost her engagement ring. And we were having a conversation about if it's covered or not on her insurance policy. And I just wasn't sure how that worked. If that's something, if it happens somewhere like out of the country or out of the state, does it matter or how does that work? It's a great question. First, bad omen for your friend. (laughs) <laughs> you go on your honeymoon and you lose the engagement ring. That's bad. And doesn't it become a, a wedding ring at, after the wedding? Uh, they're on their honeymoon. Isn't that they lost wedding ring, not an engagement ring? I don't know. Maybe. There were two, but yeah. Okay. <laughs> not the expensive one. <laughs> of course. All right. So let, let's talk about let's talk about it. Um, there are a few aspects we have to look at. First of all, most property insurance policies do have coverage for jewelry. Now, having said that, if you don't tell them specific values of your jewelry, the limits that come within the policy are small. They could be $1,000, $2,000, and likely an engagement ring and or wedding ring is going to cost more than that. So the first takeaway is in order to have coverage for an expensive piece of jewelry, you need to let your insurance carrier know and you need to make sure that 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 particular item is listed on there properly. Are you going to pay a premium for it? Yeah, and that's because you're insuring something that's not standard on the policy. You're, you're actually insuring more than the policy covers. So that's the first thing. If we can get through that hoop, and you have two options, you can either add that to your home policy or you can actually purchase a separate policy specific for jewelry and get it covered that way. Now, if we get through those two hoops, then we get to the issue of you said they lost their ring on their honeymoon. Loss is a difficult one. Was it lost? Was it stolen? Is it assumed if she puts it down out, you know, outside the sauna and comes back and it's gone that someone stole it? Or is that really where she left it and she lost it? It becomes a little bit complicated and insurance carriers have very specific language regarding if things are covered for loss or theft. And it's critical to know what your policy is going to cover. So again, in this case, let's go under the assumption that the policy is going to cover it for loss or theft. Okay, so we've made a lot of assumptions. First, we're saying that she went ahead and she purchased the the correct policy. 
and we're going under the assumption that the policy will cover her for loss as well as theft. Also, keep in mind, if you're going to claim, and, and I'm making air quotes, claim that it's stolen, it better be stolen, right? You, you don't wanna, I can't tell you how many times I've had that call, well, it's gone, so it must be stolen. Okay, what do you do if something is stolen? You normally call the police, so the insurance carrier might say, well, did you file a police report? If your answer is no, they might start scratching their head, right? And again, this is because certain policies are priced for loss and certain policies are priced for theft. It's a totally different animal, as you can imagine, totally different exposure, right? The likelihood of somebody you know, breaking into your safe and stealing something is different than you potentially having it slip off your finger while you're, you know, playing sports or something, right? And it just, it's gone. Or you just wake up one morning and realize it's no longer there. That's more loss than theft. The argument is always made, well, if, if it didn't get returned to me, it must be stolen. Well, how, you know, jewelry doesn't always have your name and phone number written on it, right? So assuming that there's a policy in place that will cover loss, then the answer would be yes. And there could be coverage for that. But most people they don't purchase specific coverage for expensive jewelry items because they don't want to pay the additional premium. And I get it. It's not cheap coverage. So it's a personal choice, but everyone should be aware that jewelry is not automatically covered for any amount and for any type of loss on these po on property insurance policies. Most of them will exclude loss altogether. So you can forget about that. Theft, Possibly, but will they with a significant low, but a significantly low limit for that jewelry, unless again you've made arrangements and you know beforehand to have higher coverage. So, do you just like if they? I mean, I, it's probably too late now because I doubt they did anything like that. Shouldn't mention it if they did. How do you, do you just tell your agent like, oh, it's this is my grandma's ring. It's you know everyone said it was worth ten thousand dollars. I mean, how do you? How do you let them know what it's actually well, worth? Well, again, in this particular case, if they had not done anything previously, the likelihood is there's a small limit of jewelry coverage on the policy anyway. So whether it's worth 5000 or 10000 it probably doesn't matter because the most they would probably get is 1000 2000 maybe. And again, if the policy does not exclude loss, that could potentially be something they can claim. However, now we're probably right around the area of their deductible, right? If they have a thousand dollar deductible and the limit for jewelry is a thousand dollars, probably no point in putting in that claim, right? And this is where, you know, it makes it where, where you realize, oh, you know, having an agent's a pretty good thing because you could ask these questions without having to actually file the claim and find out whether you have coverage or not. Mm hmm. I mean, the so if I, because now that this happened, it makes me a little nervous. <laughs> so, do yeah. I need to, what, do you know what, what they need? Like as proof, do I need, I mean, obviously I, I can't just tell them this is how much, if I wanted to buy like my, that separate policy for it, mm -hmm. like, do I need to, how do I let them know as proof? This is how much the ring is worth. It's a great question. And though they're called personal article floaters, PAFs, and, and, and you can get one from pretty much any independent insurance broker. And what you'll do is first of all, you can't insure sentimentality. That's, I'll, I'll tell you that right off the cuff, because a lot of times people will have jewelry and it's not really worth a lot, but it's, you can't calculate the value in, you know, that it means to that person. So in order to get a piece of jewelry insured on one of these policies, depending on the value, they may ask you to get an appraisal and you'll go into a jewelry store and you'll hand them the piece and you'll say, I need an appraisal on this jewelry. And they'll give you a statement of what the value is. You'll take that statement to the insurance kit company and they'll give you a premium based on that appraisal. Now you might look at that and say, well, yeah, but that's, that's not going to get me that my ring back. That's true, but you can't get a policy that will in essence give you pain and suffering on top of the loss that you have for your ring. It's just going to be, it's, it's, I hate to say it's very cold, but it's, it's just the price that you're going to pay to get that similar type of item again. Got it. Okay. Okie dokie. That's just to keep the ring on tight. Thank you. <laughs> okay, <laughs> you're well, welcome. Yeah, that's, that's what I'm going to get checked. Have a good weekend. Thank you. You too. All right. We're going to take a quick break. And when we come back, I want to talk some more about things we can do to lower not only our property insurance, our home insurance, but our auto insurance as well. Be back in a flash.
In a tough California insurance market, you need expert guidance. Trust Sussman Insurance Agency with a legacy of understanding complex coverage needs. Call 877-411-5200 or visit sussmaninsurance.com. Treating clients like family for two generations. Hello, hello. Welcome back. Thanks again for being here with me on Insurance Hour. I am your host, Carl Sussman. And please remember, you can reach out with your questions at questions at insurancehour.com. And of course, you can call in and leave me a voicemail if I don't pick up, or you might get right on the air at 559-656-0317. If you need immediate assistance, like right this very second, on your cell phone, just dial pound 250, use the keyword insurance, and then you should be connected to someone that can help you right away. Do I even have to say on your cell phone anymore? It's amazing how many people don't have landlines. Do you have a landline? I still have one, but I have the ringer turned off. So I suppose it's just there for emergencies, right? In the event that the cell towers go down or the cellular network goes down or something happens and I need to make a call out. But I stopped answering that landline years ago. Let me know, I'm curious about you. Do you have a cell phone? Do you have a landline or not? I'd, I'd love to know. I'm kind of curious at this point now that I'm thinking about it. Anyway, before the uh, break, we were talking about things that we can do to lower our insurance premium, especially because these days, let's face it, prices are higher and we've talked about that. So let me go over or, and go over a few basic things that you can do in order to lower your insurance premium. The first thing that you want to do is potentially talk to your agent or broker and ask them one question, one very specific question. Say, please give me a list of every discount available for my policy. Mic drop, you're done. Just ask that question. Don't say, am I getting all my discounts? Don't say, are there any discounts that I'm not getting? Ask them, make them work. Say, please give me a list of every discount that's available for my auto policy, let's say, or for my home insurance policy, let's say, whatever it is. Make them, do the, make them do the work and give you a complete list. Uh, now, being a broker, I can tell you when, when clients ask for things like that, it's eye roll, deep sigh, and we do it because again, we're, our, we're always looking out for our clients to try and be sure that we're giving them all those discounts anyway. But if they ask, good on them. Give them that list. Let them be able to see that we've, all, we've already been doing the right thing for them. But I think what most people will find is if they ask that question, they're going to find that there are actually discounts that they were not getting before. And it doesn't mean their agent's good or bad. It doesn't mean their insurance company was up to some nefarious business, didn't tell them, blah, blah, blah. I'm sure if you read the policy, all of the discounts are in there. And I know you all just sit and love to read your policies. That's, that's your Friday night, right? You don't want to go out. You don't want to go out on Saturday night for sure. You want to sit home and read your insurance policy. So all of those things are in there. Just keep in mind that an easy way to be able to lower your price is just ask that very specific, poignant question and ask them to email it to you. That way you can literally go through it like a checklist. Another way that you can lower your insurance premium is with the deductible. Now, you know the deductible basically is the amount that you would be responsible for before the insurance carrier would start paying. If it's a car, then if there's $2,000 in damage, you have a $1,000 deductible, you would be looking to recover about $1,000, right? Now, it makes sense that the lower your deductible is, the more the insurance company would have to pay if there was a claim, the higher your premium will be. So it works the same way. The higher your deductible is, the less the insurance carrier might have to pay out and the lower your premium will be. And I'll let you in on a little secret. Small claims, are the bane of insurance carriers' existence and consumers, both. And let me explain why. When I say a small claim, I'm talking about a small claim, something that you would hope that you would be able to handle on your own, but for whatever reason, you can't. I'm not talking about the house burned down in a fire. I'm not talking about the car was totaled. I'm talking about, you know, somebody hit your bumper, somebody sideswiped you, things like that, that cost, a, let's just pick a number, a couple of thousand dollars. The problem with those types of claims are, the insurance carrier actually ends up having to spend so much money for you to get that small payout of $1,500, let's say, that it affects the rate you're going to pay, it affects the insurance carrier's bottom line, and therefore the rate that everybody is going to pay. So higher deductibles don't just actuarially lower your premium based on simple math, 
But what they do is they eliminate those small claims. And the less of those small claims there are, the lower the overall premium is going to be industry-wide. For example, there was a time when you would be able to purchase a $0 deductible policy on your automobile insurance. So if the car was in an accident, you'd have zero deductible, zero. Or if somebody went by and keyed the car because they were pissed off at you, zero deductible, they would fix it. So what do you think the likelihood is that people would put in a claim if anything happened to their car? A bird pooped on it if they wanted to put a claim in, they got 50 bucks. I mean, they've got zero dollar deductible, go for it, put it in, right, who cares? So it works the same way. If you can go with a higher deductible, number one, you're going to save money on your premium. Number two, you're going to be in a position to maintain things like claim-free discounts, and that's always a good thing. It also can impact the value of your property if we're talking about um, homes, because claims on properties have to be disclosed when you're selling a home, so there's that entire value as well. And as a, as a group, as a large group, as consumers, if those low claim amounts start to go down, then what's going to happen is all premiums are going to start going down. And I know, don't be cynical. No, oh, they're just gonna keep the extra money. No, trust me, insurance carriers are regulated. They can't just make any amount of money they want. They need to substantiate rate changes up and down, literally up and down. State laws change and they might vary depending on where you are, but in a general sense, the carriers can't just randomly pick a number and say, hey, cool, okay? so. If we can get rid of those lower, smaller claims, it might be the toilet overflow because, you know, it's an old toilet, the flap, you know, that goes up and down, wore out, and it just got some water on the floor. And we're not talking about the entire house, but the bathroom got, you know, kind of mushy and you have to clean it out and maybe repaint, fix the floor. Yeah, that might cost you a couple thousand dollars. It might even cost you five or six thousand dollars. But if you take a deductible off of that, and then the entire process you have to go through, the amount of money that it's going to cost overall to the insurance carrier is significantly higher than it would be for what is out of your pocket. The actual dollar amounts will be higher. And because of that, you're going to see a higher insurance premium later. That's just, again, it's math. It's the way the business works. So if you can have a higher deductible, you don't just save money on your premium, but you're saving a lot of other dollars potentially immediately and in the long term. So that's deductibles. As far as saving money on your, um, your home insurance, so other things you can look at that people might not be aware of, and again, I always go back to that master question that you should ask everyone, right? That you should ask your agent. Find out about smart devices, things like the ring doorbell, things like drop cameras, things like Google cameras, things like, and no, none of them are sponsoring, but smart devices are, are items that you can put in your home that will help you be made aware in the event there's a loss. There's a company, I'm, I'm blanking out on the name right now, that um, has these little sensors that you can put, you stick them with double stick tape like next to the toilet or next to the shower, and in the event they get wet, your phone gets an alert. Guess what? If that toilet overflows, or if you put one under you know, the counter by the sink and it gets wet and it overflows, boom, you're gonna know, you're gonna hear about it, and guess what? You're going to be able to stop that from becoming a massive loss into being potentially a smaller loss. Guess what? The insurance carriers get that. So a lot of them are offering discounts for people that will put in these devices because they know it takes what could be a catastrophic loss of water that f goes throughout the entire house to just the bathroom. Then they got an alert, they went, they turned off the water and they repaired it. So look for smart devices. It could be a smart water device. It could be an earthquake shutoff valve, depending on what state you're in and which carrier you're with. Incidentally, an insurance company loves the earthquake shutoff valve. If you're not familiar, it's a little device. It goes between the gas line of your house and the uh, it goes between the gas coming into your house and the line into your house. And it has one of those little floaty things in it, right? Uh, like a leveler you've seen. And if it shakes to a certain extent, uh, it triggers something and it cuts off the gas going into the house. Guess what doesn't happen after an earthquake? Gas leaks and boom. Earthquake shutoff valve. Big discounts available with a lot of carriers for having that. And again, back to my mantra. Plus, it keeps your house from, you know, 
burning and having a loss. Remember, that's the goal. That's the wish, right? That we just don't have a loss. So earthquake shutoff valves. As far as vehicles go, another way to save some money is if your vehicle gets to a point where the value is low enough, where you can say to yourself, if I don't insure the vehicle itself, I'm not talking about liability, I'm talking about the vehicle itself, in maybe two years, the premium I'm paying would equal the value of the vehicle. Two to three years is sort of that sweet spot where it might make sense just no longer to cover insurance on that vehicle. So again, you can do that math to figure it out. So I hope some of this was helpful for you to understand everything about inflation's effect on insurance premiums to discounts that are available to things that you can do. We talked a little bit about jewelry coverage as well. We covered a lot of different things today. The goal is for you to understand how your insurance policy works and utilize it best. I say take advantage, but in a good way, utilize it the way it's designed to be, pay the premium that you need to pay and not more and not less. And just remember that at the end of the day, these are choices that you can make. There's a lot of customization that you can have on your insurance policies. If you wanna really take the time to do it, a lot of times I go, nobody loves it. They don't wanna take the time to do it. But if you wanna save money, if you wanna know what you have and utilize it the best you can, Take the time to either read your policy and or talk to an insurance agent or broker and be sure that they can help answer questions for you. I do want to thank all of you for taking the time to listen today. I know insurance is not necessarily the most sexy concept. It's not the most exciting thing in the world. It is important that you understand what it is you're getting, what you should be looking for, red flags, you name it. You just need to know more than you used to. Things are more complicated than they used to be. If you have any questions, please reach out to me directly. You can email your questions to questions at insurancehour.com or call and leave a voicemail at 559 559- 656-0317. Educating and entertaining Californians one insurance policy at a time. This is Insurance Hour. This show is dedicated to Shamrock Papa.